Our third panel today looks at the varying responses of the Irish and the Native Americans of Ireland and Virginia to English encroachments uh, into their respective locales in the late 16th and early 17th century. So our first speaker is Hiram Morgan. Hiram is a senior lecturer in history at University College Cork. His groundbreaking monograph, published in 1993, Tyrone's Rebellion, the Outbreak of the Nine Years' War in Tudor Ireland, look, examined government policy in Ulster in the 1580s and 1590s and explained how the policies at this time led Hugh O'Neill, second Earl of Tyrone, into the rebellion terms, the Nine Years' War. More recently, his work has engaged with such wide-ranging issues as the life and career of Richard of the Old English Humanist, Richard Stanyhurst, and the Cataclysmic Battle of Kinsale in 1601. Currently, he is preparing an edition for publication of the late Elizabethan treatise, The Supplication of the Blood of the English, written in the aftermath of the 1598 revolt in Munster. His, his paper today examines the reactions of the Irish and Old English of Munster to the plantation of the province undertaken by English adventurers during the reign of Queen Elizabeth. So, over to you, Herman. In 16th century, Munster was a relatively prosperous province in Ireland on the European periphery. It possessed well-established coastal towns, notably Waterford, Cork and Limerick, <laughs> and had done so since Viking times with substantial and long-standing trading links with the west of England and the continent. The middle of the province had some of the most fertile land in Ireland, and its shores attracted fishermen from elsewhere in Europe, eager to exploit its pelagic fish stocks. Politically, Munster was divided between the Anglo-Irish and Gaelic lordships, but it was substantially integrated through intermarriage with the Irish language predominant throughout the countryside and penetrating into the towns as well. This next slide shows Black Tom, Earl of Ormond. The problems in Munster did not arise from the, a colonial situation here in Munster. In the first instance, it arose from a feudal rivalry and the burgeoning power of the Tudor state. The disputes between the Fitzgerald House of Desmond in the centre of the province and the Butler House of Ormond straddling the eastern borders of the province in South Leinster were centuries old. In the Tudor period, the Ormonds, as a result of their Boleyn connection, were far better connected at court. When in 1565, Gerard Fitzgerald, 10th Earl of Desmond, and Thomas Butler, 12th Earl of Ormond, fought the Battle of, of a fian over competing claims in Waterford, it was inevitably the Desmonds who came out the worst. For fighting what is regarded as the last engagement to, between feudal retinues, they were called to court and fined. Desmond ended up in prison in the Tower of London and cornered in death. I've lost the presentation. What's happened? Sorry, you need to, to share content again, Harm. How did that happen? I'm not too sure. Yeah. Is the PowerPoint still open in the, the desktop behind it or? Yeah. Well, it's opening again. Ah, yeah, it's just coming up there now. To rescue the situation, Desmond decided to lease or mortgage his South Cork estates in the barony of Carricurhy to Warham St. Ledger, the second son of Anthony St. Ledger, a former Lord Deputy of Ireland. St. Ledger's arrival in Cork coincided with the establishment of a provincial presidency. 
of Monster to impose more direct government rule in the province. Both this new administrative arrangement and the Karakurahi lease left James Fitzmaurice Fitzgerald aggrieved as he was not only the captain of Desmond's forces, but he was also successor to his father's tenancy in that South Cork barony. And here you can see an enlargement of the um, speed map. This is Karakuri, this triangle of land uh, containing Karakalang with its castle on the estuary on Cork Harbour and Tracton Abbey, which is further inland. They, they were the two main sites. This slide uh, shows uh, Richard Grenville. Warren St. Ledger and a consortium of other adventurer friends quickly saw the opportunity to widen their ambitions with a scheme to take over the fisheries and coastal areas in Gaelic areas of Cork and Kerry. This involved later American adventurers, Sir Humphrey Gilbert and Sir Richard Grenville, who was recently appointed Sheriff of Cork, as well as Peter Carew, who was making land claims across the country in Cork and Kerry and in Carlow. All of this gave Fitzmaurice an opportunity to lead a revolt, not only of the Fitzgeralds of Desmond, but also their McCarthy rivals, as well as dissident butlers. To galvanize the revolt, he invoked religion, advancing the Catholic cause against what he called Huguenots. And following his and others' meetings in an alleged national parliament, Fitzgibbon, the Archbishop of Cashel, to Spain to offer the throne of Ireland to Philip II. Fitzmaurice took back Carcaline and Tracton and threatened Cork City. But despite all these religious claims, Fitzmaurice was no angel, as the towns of Munster soon found out. So some of the smaller towns in Munster were uh, eventually complied after shows of force or execution of force, but the larger towns in Munster stayed loyal. The result of um, Fitzmaurice's revolt was a brutal su suppression of this dissident activity in the southern province. Lord Deputy Sidney himself came to Munster, lifted the siege on Cork and took back Caracalline. The rest of the revolt suppression was left to others. The worst reputation belonged to Sir Humphrey Gilbert. As colonel of the forces in Munster, he terrorised the population, most famously setting up an avenue of beheaded Munster men through which relatives coming to submit had to pass. Sir John Perrett, pictured here, was the first fully fledged Lord President of Munster between 1571 and 73, and he continued a vicious campaign of hangings using martial law. One of the latter moments was his challenge of single comment combat to Fitzmaurice, whom he failed to catch. Having accoutred himself as an Irish Kern, he waited on Fitzmaurice, but Fitzmaurice failed to show up, asserting that whilst the Queen could send another governor of Munster, the Geraldines could not easily find another leader. Fitzmaurice eventually submitted as Perrot's campaign ran out of steam, but after the release and return home of the Earl of Desmond, Fitzmaurice himself sealed into exile in France and eventually made his way to Rome. This is a slide of propaganda images uh, from later English propagandists about the Popish threat. In Rome, Fitzmaurice received the support of Gregory XIII against England's heretic queen. Unfortunately, the bulk of the papal forces assigned to the mission to Ireland were hijacked by Thomas Stukeley, an English adventurer who, who had hitched himself to the Irish cause and he went instead with the forces on the King of Portugal's madcap crusade to Morocco. As a result, Fitzmaurice, when he unfurled the papal banners in Dingle in County Kerry and distributed printed proclamations reciting the Pope's excommunication of Queen Elizabeth, he had only a handful of men and he himself was shortly afterwards killed in a skirmish 
by his cousin. John of Desmond and other Geraldines had already joined him, though, signaling their adherence by the killing, shown here, of Henry Davils and Arthur Carter in Tralee. However, it was the overreaction of English commanders, notably Nicholas Malby, to the escalating situation, which forced the Earl of Desmond himself into revolt. Even though he had sought to avoid conflict, the Earl now found himself leading a province-wide revolt. Uh, this is the Smerrick Memorial uh, near Dingle. The reaction by the English Crown to what was perceived as people-inspired insurrection in Ireland, aided by Spain in sending the forces onwards to a strategically exposed region of Munster, was not surprisingly brutal and thorough. At Smerrick in 1580, Lord Deputy Grey, assisted by Sir Walter Raleigh and recorded by Edmund Spencer, massacred the six, 600 Italian mercenaries who had arrived to reinforce the Geraldines. This time there was no negotiated settlement and the Earl was forced to go on the run. A starvation policy was pursued to prevent the population supporting what had become a guerrilla war. This is memorialized in Spencer's famous Anatomies of Death passage. Quote, in a short space, there were none almost left, and a most populous and plentiful country suddenly left void of man or beast. Yet, sure in all that war, there perished not many by the sword, but all by the extremity of famine, which they themselves had wrought. Interestingly, a great deal of this devastation and hardship was wrought by Thomas, Earl of Ormond, who was given control of the mopping up operations. With Gerald, Earl of Desmond dying as a proclaimed rebel in 1583 at the hands of the Moriarty's, his lands were now subject to confiscation, and this was sanctioned by the Act of the Irish Parliament in 1585. The slides are gone. Sorry? The slides are gone. Really? Can you see that? Oh, I need to see you, but not the slides. Uh, right, I can... Can you see the slides? Uh, I can see the slides, Harm. Yeah, okay. back again. Okay. This is a map of the Munster Plantation. In all, half a million acres were confiscated from the Earl of Desmond and his associates in a rebellion. The decision to plant an Anglo-Irish territory, mm -hmm. albeit a heavily Gaelicized one, was a new departure, but the pl policy of plantation had been perceived by the state since the 1540s as a means of bringing in new investment and of securing a loyal population. The idea was to take advantage of the land hunger in England. Large landowners, rich merchants and influential courtiers and office holders were given grants who were in turn to attract English settlers. Walter Raleigh had tried his best to drive the Barrys into rebellion as a captain during the war, but failed. Now is the Queen's favourite he received the largest grant of 40,000 acres in the Blackwater Valley, near Yall and at centred at Lismore. Of course, he was otherwise engaged at this period, being the successor to Humphrey Gilbert's project in North America. Others got between 12,000 and 4,000 acres. Those were the normal portions, with the poet Spencer, a minor official, receiving the smaller grant at Kilcolman in North Cork. The grantees and settlers were also to bring in English stock, promote arable farming, and promote English culture generally, whilst also bolstering Protestantism and strengthening the province against foreign interference. They were also greedy. Their surveys included the so-called chargeable lands, lands owned by others who had rendered military service to the Earl of Desmond. And you can see here Cargillan Castle in this slide. St. Ledger uh, was based at Carcline, and the first type of challenge to plantation, in fact, was not military, it was legal, and it was by political means. The people in Ulster, or Munster, in other words, reacted 
as aggrieved subjects. Lobbying at court and after three land commissions, some adjustments were made in favour of the natives whose lands were being illegally detained. Carcaline is a case in point. By 1589, Warren Sledger had brought in 44 men and his partner Grenville 99. Notionally, St. Ledger had the maximum 12,000 acre grant, but half of this proved to be chargeable lands and the local proprietors in 1592 got 6,000 acres back. One planter, Hugh Cobb, lost most of his original grant and had to be found lands elsewhere. However, only a small percentage of land was returned and so tensions remained. Furthermore, first survey problems and then these legal issues held up English colonization with only a quarter or a third of the projected 50,000, 15,000, sorry, settlers arriving in the first decade. The 1598 revolt. This is a image of Hugh O'Neill, Earl of Tyrone. The situation in Munster in the course of the 1590s was further aggravated as English planters began to eye up the lands of the aging Earl of Clancarty, the McCarthy Moore and Car Carry, who had no who had no legitimate male heir. If they could not marry his heir heiress for their own benefit, they were there was always the prospect of it being taken over by the crown when the Earl died at the end of 1596. Besides this, the search for concealed lands was causing further havoc with one Richard Boyle as deputy cheater. Though this was a random process delving into land title, which was as apt to annoy the new planters as much as the existing occupiers. Direct methods against the planters began to be taken. First, Donal Oak McCarthy, the Earl of Clancarty's illegitimate son, began attacks. Then the McSheehys, the former Gallo classes of the Earl of Desmond, based in County Limerick, began attacks. Terrorising and kidnapping planters, they seriously destabilised the north parts of the plantation until the three bro brothers who led them were tracked down in 1597. The last of them, Murrah, executed in Cork City, accused of praying, burning and murdering 80 English families. Uh, Murrah was executed by sledgehammer for those interested. The Sheehy attacks were essential background to what happened in 1598 because they had put the frighteners on the planters. The revolt of the Earl of Tyrone had been spreading from the north from 1594 and it suddenly accelerated when he won the Battle of the Yellow Fort in August 1598. The revolt immediately escalated into a, immediately escalated to a different level in the Midlands, from which O'Neill's lieutenant, Captain Richard Terrell, and his ally Oni O'Moore led a small force into Munster at the start of October 1598. They were joined by James Fitzthomas Fitzgerald and Donald Og McCarthy, who were made the Earl of Desmond and McCarthy Moore, respectively. When loyal gentry of the province and planter militia failed to assemble in numbers. The Lord President Thomas Norris, overestimating the Irish forces, decided not to confront the invaders and those adhering to them. As a result of Norris's stand down, as a result, the plantation across Munster collapsed in the space of a couple of days. The grantees abandoned their castles and they and their tenants fleeing to the towns, being attacked by the Irish as they went. Afterwards, the English feared that this had been a premeditated Catholic stroke Irish conspiracy against the plantation. But in retrospect, it appears more likely that with the collapse of planter confidence, the Irish simply took the opportunity to avenge grievances which had been accumulating over many years. So massacre or propaganda, or both. At the time of the 1598 revolt, documents like this 
anonymous supplication of the blood of English seen here. <clears throat> English commentators were claiming that a massacre and systematic violence had taken place. Another writer, uh, Chief Justice Saxe, who himself fled to England, he claimed, quote, these combinations of revolts have affected many execrable murders and cruelties upon the English, as well in the county of Limerick as in the counties of Cork and Kerry and elsewhere. Infants taken from the nurse's breast and brains dashed against walls, the heart plucked out of the body of the husband in the view of his wife, who was forced to yield the use of her apron to wipe off the blood of the murderer's fingers. An English gentleman at midday in a town cruelly murdered and his head cleft in divers pieces. Divers sent into Yawl amongst the English, some of them with their throats cut, but not killed some with their tongues cut out of their heads, others with their noses cut off. The view whereof might, view whereof the English might more bitterly lament the misery of their country and fear the like to befall themselves. However, there's no evidence of these claims. No names are given for those allegedly murdered. No claims lodged for compensation. or for assistance for those who had been mutilated. As AJ Sheehan estimated, a couple of hundred were dead at the most. So this massacre is a strange event in some respects. Very few names at all. Most of the English fleeing to the towns, maybe up to 3,000, were murdered, sorry, were not murdered, were robbed of valuables and stripped of their clothes. Once there, they had no resources, Once there, those who had no resources or who could get no passage to England were left destitute on the charity and shelter of the Anglo-Irish towns. The point of refuge, refuge from here, south of Cork City, was into the city itself. From here, Walter St. Ledger, Warham St. Ledger's Ur, fled uh, from Ballangarry. Thomas Ditton fled from Carrigaline. William Clavell from Carrick Rohan, and Thomas Daunton, Christopher Sampson from Tracton. The most famous refugee was the Protestant Bishop William Lyon, who, quote, loath to be a martyr, as one commentator wrote, fled from Ross Carberry to his palace outside Cork City, and then, as things worsened, fled inside the city itself. The motivation, the motivation for attacks on the settlers was a combination of factors, opportunistic robbery and payback for sufferings and exploitation of English hands, against a background of re religious antagonisms and Catholic incitement and long-term national hatred. Some of the violence was also symbolic. Houses with chimneys, wearers of English clothes, riders using English saddles, speakers of English were targeted. At Mallow, Lord President Norris's park, Uh, that's presumably a clo enclosed area with fencing. His deer was led out and his English sheep spoiled. Uh, this is a image we'll get to in a minute relating to O'Neill's visit to Cork in 1600. Quick action taken by the Earl of Ormond did much to save Munster for England when the aging loyalist re garrisoned the towns. However, he himself did nothing to save the plantation at the time, and perhaps he didn't wish to. Nor could he prevent, uh, a year later, the leader of the Irish Confederates, Hugh O'Neill, visiting the province in early 1600. However, O'Neill's visit revealed the limitations of the native Irish lands. Hugh O'Neill assisted by uh, seminary priests and uh, the, the Jesuit James Archer of Kilkenny. Oh, they appealed to the recalcitrant in Munster as fellow Catholics and Irishmen, but the appeals fell on deaf ears. 
the townsmen bided their time. When O'Neill and his force marched past Cork City, the town guns under the command of the Lord Murr remained silent, much to the annoyance of Bishop Lyon. The biggest standoff took place at Barry's Court Castle, where O'Neill demanded that David Lord Butterfin change sides or face the consequences. Your impiety to God, cruelty to your soul and body, tyranny and ingratitude both to your followers and country are inexcusable and intolerable. You separated yourself from the unity of Christ, his mystical body, the Catholic Church. However, Barry replied that neither the Queen nor her predecessors had done any harm to him or had she restricted his religious observance. As a result, O'Neill entered Great Island and burned Barry's lands there amounting to 220 towns and villages. In fact, this was actually a reflection of O'Neill's lack of power. Barry in particular had no wish to bring back Geraldine power or Gaelic power in the province and other gentry thought the same. And of course, they also feared the consequences. Had they joined O'Neill, they would have faced cons confiscation as well, or that's how they perceived it. O'Neill also viewed Conceal along with Florence McCarthy, whom he now appointed the McCarthy Moor instead of Don Logue. This was probably not a great choice, but Florence's regional support was important as his lands were always the most likely Spanish landing place. Both the issues with the Barrys and McCarthy's were indicative of a wider issue facing the whole Irish Catholic war effort and fatally undermining it, divisions. Not only divisions between Gaelic Irish and Anglo Irish, but also divisions fraternal and collateral within each family. O'Neill also suffered a signal disaster just before he left the province with the death of his son-in-law, cousin and commander of his cavalry, Hugh Maguire. On the 1st of March, O'Neill sent Maguire with 100 horse and 200 foot across the lead to spoil Caracurahe. The English cavalry force was led out by Warham's Ledger from Cork City. Uh, Warham's Ledger was the original St. Ledger's nephew. Uh, he led out a force to try and stop O'Neill, uh, or more precisely, Maguire. In a frontal assault, the Fermanagh Lord was cut down by the discharge of Lauren, uh, St. Ledger's Petronels, which are big pistols. Maguire fell from his horse and died, but he had managed to wound Sir Warham in the head with his staff. St. Ledger, badly wounded, reached Cork City, but died four days later. It could have been much worse. O'Neill trying to cross the river to help Maguire was in danger of drowning when his horse lost its footing. At the Battle of Conceal in 1601, Catholic dissidents in Ireland received what they had long asked for, a substantial foreign intervention by Philip III of Spain. However, George Carew, the English governor of Munster, had substantially quelled, quelled the province through a mixture of war and diplomacy. Hundreds of pardons had been issued on the one hand, and on the other hand, and crucially for the Spanish expedition's success, the local Irish leaders, James Fitz Thomas Fitzgerald and Florence McCarthy, had been arrested and sent over to England to the Tower of London. The Battle of Conceal was won decisively by the English. As O'Neill said, today this kingdom was lost. And with it, of course, the prospect of a significant change in England's dynastic, religious and imperial fortunes as well. Although the revolt had spread to West Cork, the Catholic towns of the province had stayed neutral, with some clergy even preaching against the Spaniards, as they had they were not carrying the appropriate papal excommunication and authorization. The dog of religion barked too late. Cork City only stirred itself when Elizabeth died in March 1603 with a pointless demonstration of religious fervour in the vain hope that her successor, James, as the son of Mary Queen of Scots, might prove favourable to Catholicism. Uh, 
And this is an image of uh, Richard Boyle. Strangely, the 1598 revolt in Munster did not lead to another round of confiscations. Perhaps in the light of the 98 revolt, the English government thought that would be unwise. In fact, commerce, legal chicanery, and where necessary, martial law replaced confiscation as the Munster plantation was renewed and consolidated. Richard Boyle, already accumulating province uh, property in the province took over Raleigh's vast holdings to establish himself by 1620 as the Earl of Cork and setting himself on the way to be one of the richest men in these islands. Gaelic land holding, as happened simultaneously in East Ulster, could not withstand the legal, commercial, and extra legal pressures, and the winners were expanding English planters and Catholic merchants from the town. In West Cork, Banton was developed and were the O'Sullivans, O'Driscolls and O'Donovans once ruled supreme, English pirates developed the ultimate free enterprise economy. Cash crops were sought after. First asset stripping in timber and iron smelting, then exploiting the fishery, particularly of pilchards, and ultimately though it was the commercialization of the traditional economy, which the English were hoping to suppress in the first instance, it was what did the, the trick, the transformation and commercialization of the cattle economy. First live export, exports and later beef and dairy produce were sent out from Southern Ireland. All of this was an end in itself. There was generally no need to migrate further to Virginia to, to gain success. When interest in the new world did develop, it was in the first instance Catholic merchants in concealed targeting the Leeward Islands in the Caribbean. The 1641 rebellion showed that religious and national tensions hadn't gone away. However, the early trajectory was continued soon afterwards with Boyle's sons and here in Carrigaline by Viscount Shannon, who built his house, I think probably after the restoration at Shannon Park, and dreamed of transferring the trade of Cork City to the area, something which has ironically eventually come to pass with the transfer of the Port of Cork out of the Inner Harbour to Ringiskeda. So some final concluding remarks. To sum up, perhaps some comparative remarks about Munster and Virginia. Both the Irish and the Amerindians were divided peoples and the colonialists exploited those divisions, but there are the comparison stops. The Irish were Europeans with continental links. They could act as subjects by challenging English aggression legally and by lobbying at court, believing their constitutional rights to be threatened or believing in fact they did have constitutional rights, they could also revolt as smaller nations also did in the period. They could and did appeal to other European powers, even offering them the sovereignty of their country. And as was also the case in the early modern period, utilizing the cause of religion that was tearing Europe apart. Furthermore, the Irish were not susceptible to European diseases in the same way as the American Indians were. Indeed, if anything, the English suffered in coming to Ireland's wet climate. In actuality, what Munster and Virginia and the episodes involving them and the English had in common were the unusually acquisitive, entrepreneurial and ambitious group of Englishmen, variously known as adventurers, planters, privateers and pirates. Beginning with the dissolution of the monasteries in England, there was a cohort of Englishmen, often younger sons, who needed to find a place in the privatising English world system. They proved to be high achievers, coming from relatively poor backgrounds or regions. They were always strangely enough, sufficiently educated to pen a justifying, if not glorifying account of their activities to court or to publish a pamphlet to promote their ventures. In Ireland, 
Though there was a medieval Anglo-Norman precedent for colonization, the main objects of this group here called the New English, the main objects were cheap land, profit and a seigneurial lifestyle. They would drive the natives into revolt to get it. They would lobby at court for patents to the subsequently confiscated lands. And they would engage in all sorts of legal chicanery to get more land. And indeed, also their relatives pursuing careers in the Church of Ireland were really doing much the same thing. These planters were interested in quick profits and eventually in cash crops, mostly in most notably in tobacco in Virginia and cattle here in Munster. And those cash crops emerged to serve their purposes. These men were also violent, unscrupulous and flexible individuals who would manipulate, manipulate native landowning systems whilst at the same time subverting and ripping off the Crown's own laws and institutions. As such, they were similar in, in ambition to the, the Spanish Hidalgos who conquered the Indies. However, they were ultimately more successful. They were more capitalistic, they were greater risk takers, and they came with an absolutist Protestant mindset, which brooked no opposition. Thank you. Okay, thanks indeed for that, Horan, um, which has given us the, the unusual suggestion of uh, somebody being executed by sledgehammer, which um, <laughs> is, is a new one on most of us, I would imagine. Um, so we'll, um, we'll hold over, as, uh, as usual, the, uh, the, the questions until the end. So we'll move straight along to, um, to uh, Dr. Sherry Shock Hall. Um, Harm, if you could actually, could you just stop um, sharing the um, sure. PowerPoint? Perfect. Has it okay. stopped, David? Uh, uh, it, yeah, it's, it's, it's over to Sherry now. Yeah. Okay, so Dr. Sherry Shokol is Professor of History and Director of the Public History Centre at Christopher Newport University in Newport News, Virginia. She is the author of Journey to the West, the Alabama and Cushata Indians, published by the University of Oklahoma Press, and Map Mapping the Mississippian, Mississippian Shatter Zone, published by the University of Nebraska Press. So Professor Shokol has worked with tribal advocates seeking land restitution in federal courts for broken US treaties, and she promotes innovative ways to communicate history to the public. And today she's going to discuss the Powhatan Indians of Virginia and their reactions to the English invasion. Great, thank you so much, David. Um, and I just wanted to make sure everyone can, uh, can see the screen okay? Uh, my my uh, presentation is showing. Yes. OK, fantastic. Well, thank you so much. It's a real great pleasure and honor to be a part of this program. And uh, today we are going to look at the American Indian perspective, specifically examining uh, the following questions. Who were uh, the people that lived on the land before the English and how did the leaders consolidate power? Uh, what happened to the indigenous peoples in their homeland? And finally, uh, what were the long-term ramifications of the English invasion? Okay, so let's go uh, start first with uh, Powhatan. Uh, his his uh, natural name was Wahunsenakak, and he was a member of the Pamunkey tribe. Uh, he ruled over a paramount chiefdom and controlled most of uh, 30 Algonquian speaking tribes that would eventually become Virginia. Uh, chiefdoms were authoritarian rank societies that consisted of towns, villages, and hamlets ruled by a hereditary paramount chief chieftain. Uh, Powhatan consolidated his power by placing uh, under his protection the tribes who feared their enemies to the west, such as the powerful Monacans. 
The Palatine chieftain, uh, chiefdom consisted of over 24,000 Algonquians, and he had Weronces to help him rule. Uh, these men were relatives and lieutenants who lived in subject towns, and what they did is they collected tribute in the form of corn, fur, deerskins, and cold hammered copper, which was extremely valuable for trade um, among the Powhatan groups. Uh, Powhatan subject peoples gave tribute in exchange for this protection to be under this paramount chiefdom. Uh, his paramount capital was at Werewakumako, and uh, if you can see on this map right here, if you can see my, my pointer here, uh, where Wakomoko was in the center, and it was off uh, the York River. It's in present day uh, Gloucester, uh, Virginia. But uh, if you can see on the map, all that is colored in purple, this is what he controlled in his uh, paramount chiefdom. Here is his capital, or at least what it would have look, looked like based on uh, scholarship. Uh, now, here's a very interesting fact uh, about Powhatan and, and his uh, paramount chiefdom, is that he had at least 100 wives, if not more, by 1610. Uh, I know some, some people uh, scratch their heads at that because that's, that's a lot, that's a lot of wives. And therefore, um, he had at least 100 children. Uh, he would have had the best looking marriageable, marriageable young women from his subordinate villages come and visit him um, at Werewakomoko. And he would pay uh, a bride's well to her parents if she agreed to marry uh, him, and most did because it was uh, an increase in their status if, if, if she did so. And uh, she would live with his other wives uh, until she had a child with him. And when she had that child, she would be sent back home uh, to, her, uh, to her main village, and he would actually provide for her and his child. Uh, she would be able to divorce and remarry if she chose. Um, again, this was um, in many ways a, a, a good, um, a sizable status for her. Uh, Powhatan's children would live at Werewakomoko when they were old enough uh, to receive additional training and many of those sons would become Weronces uh, and rule over those uh, villages and communities. This practice ex created extensive and valuable kinship ties within his chiefdom. Let's look at the English invasion in 1607. Um, why would Powhatan be interested in the English? I mean, the, the English came in, they didn't ask for um, a, they didn't have a proper invitation. They didn't ask for permission to start settling in Jamestown or start building a fort. Um, why not just destroy them outright? Um, in many ways, if you see it from Powhatan's perspective, he's looking at this and thinking, well, the English have valuable trade goods. Uh, for example, they have metals, tools, uh, and they have copper. Um, and this would potentially be uh, possibly traded for corn. Uh, and it was something that the English definitely needed because they were always lacking food. Uh, so perhaps he was thinking, why not incorporate them into uh, the chieftain? So let's look at the English attitudes towards American Indians. Uh, before we move forward, there is a duality here. Um, and the duality that exists is on the one hand, American Indians are seen as gentle, uh, eager to receive new ideas. Uh, in many ways, that, that term of the noble savage. Um, new, the new world was seen as a garden of Eden. Uh, that trade in fact would uh, be necessary, at least at first, uh, versus the other perspective, the other attitude towards American Indians was that they were viewed as savage, uh, hostile, beast-like, cursed by God. Uh, they had sexual abandon. And along with this, this version of uh, their views of American Indians, it came with a message, and that was to deny them humanity. So the goals of the English colonial planning was very much based on Irish and Scottish models. And this goes back to the uh, a period of Roman imperialism. The first goal was military conquest. 
Second, military occupation and bureaucracy. And third, removal of natives and the resettlement with an English population. Uh, conquest and massacres in Ireland were their examples. For uh, If you look at Walter Raleigh's uh, Siege of Smerwick and Humphrey Gilbert, who waged a campaign of terror in Munster, they murdered and executed men, women, and children with reckless abandon. The English would apply these same tactics to the Americas and in particular to the Virginia tribes and later to the tribes in the North, uh, Northeast. So the emergent formula that comes out of this is that there's friendly trade, but it's mixed with inevitable violence. And there is the duality. Uh, I wanted to share just a couple of images showing you again that, that duality. This one is uh, focusing on a uh, Algonquian ceremony. And again, it seems like um, it's relatively innocent enough, um, although I would say this is more indicative of the noble savage where, um, you know, clearly there's a lack of clothing, um, but also it looks a little wild and crazy, but it seems innocent. Um, this is something that um, would have been circulated uh, as, as um, we've already seen in some other presentations that um, a lot of the images that are coming out of the Americas um, in, in regards to what they perceived American Indians to be like, um, you know, a lot of people were very curious. Uh, now, this one is definitely, um, it's, it's, it's more intense and uh, clearly this has a very specific point of view towards American Indians in that they have just pure savagery. And in this case, if you note, there's aspects of cannibalism. Um, in this case, you have uh, the uh, Europeans who are captives. And uh, in, in this case, uh, there are these American Indians uh, who are decapitating people. Here's a head right here. And if you can see in the background, um, they have barbacoas, uh, basically barbecues. And of course, what you see on the barbecue would be uh, human legs and hands. This guy seems to be chowing down on it over here. And, and this one is being um, gutted. Uh, now, <laughs> this is from Johann Theodor uh, Debris. It's a copper engraving. And it, again, it was widely circulated in, um, uh, and reprinted in uh, 1578, but you can see that um, it, this is a portrayal of American Indians as um, cannibalistic. And we know based on uh, documentary evidence as well as archeological evidence, there is no um, case whatsoever of Southeastern tribes cannibalizing um, anything. Um, and so the only cannibalism that was taking place was at Jamestown Fort, you know, in that, in, during the starving time. Uh, so, um, but again, you can see how possibly this would be very damaging to perspective America if other. A year after the English arrival, uh, John Smith, uh, the very infamous John Smith, uh, in his effort to obtain food uh, for Jamestown, was captured and taken to Wericomico. And Smith was, now, now I know many of you know about John Smith already, but just to reemphasize, Smith was a perpetual braggart and he ran on his own alternative facts. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, what we can surmise is that something definitely happened as, as uh, he's depicting in his uh, um, narrative much later, um, it was published um, well after the fact, and, and uh, a lot of scholars have noted that he publishes um, his general history of Virginia when pretty much all the people who would have um, been uh, been there, they actually had already died. So he's, he's the last person that's actually able to, to document this. And of course, none of it's corroborated. Um, but in this case, he uh, describes very extensively, it's a very well-known myth at this point, um, that he is in fact um, um, going to be um, he's actually going to be uh, killed and he's strapped down. And of course, this is where Pocahontas comes in and you can actually see her in the corner here. Um, uh, she uh, throws herself at John Smith and she, she tells her father, please, you must save him. Well, that's, you know, Smith's rendition. And of course, scholars have, have, have definitely really thrown this out that this really did not happen. Um, however, what is really going on? There is a, a type of ceremony that, that most historians believe does take place, but the, the ceremony is likely Powhatan making Smith a Waronse. 
um, that he is pulling him into his chiefdom. Um, and as a result of him bringing him into um, the Powhatan chief, chiefdom, is that he will now demand, based on what everyone else does in uh, who's within, uh, that he will now demand that um, Smith, as the leader of the English, pay tribute. And that tribute will actually be very valuable. So as this new group is being folded into the chiefdom, um, you know, again, this is part of that process that, that John Smith may have been describing. And I do want to mention um, very quickly the role or absence of pa uh, Pocahontas. Um, Pocahontas, uh, or um, Matoaka, uh, she was, that was her real name, she was 11 years old and very much like the, the girl that is, is depicted here. Um, she was Powhatan's favorite child. And remember, uh, he at least had 100 children, and so to be the favorite out of 100, that was quite a feat. But the reason why that she was so beloved by him is that um, she made him laugh. Uh, she was described as almost like a court jester, um, someone who uh, would have relaxed him because he's probably uptight, he's probably stressed out a lot because he is controlling this, this massive uh, paramount chiefdom. Um, but the point being is that she never would have been at this ceremony that, that John Smith describes. John Smith put her in there more than likely just to make the tale um, more interesting and also to make him look good, uh, which he does quite a bit. Um, but she would have instead, po Pocahontas or uh, Matoka, she would have been preparing meals with her mother. So Christopher Newport, uh, he later tries to reverse Smith's submission or adoption uh, because uh, people realize that something took place and, and you know, they wanted to make sure that the English are not um, being submissive. So Christopher Newport wants Powhatan uh, to uh, come to Jamestown Fort and to receive a uh, proper quote unquote coronation. And essentially what's happening is that, that Newport uh, is determined to make him a vassal of James I based on orders. Um, Powhatan completely ignores this, this request. And so Newport uh, actually goes to Wericomoco and he will provide these gifts um, from James I. And it included the, the copper crown and uh, uh, the scarlet robe. Well, Powhatan uh, refused to kneel to actually uh, be crowned by Christopher Newport. And Christopher Newport understand that he was much uh, shorter in stature compared to Powhatan. Um, and uh, uh, Christopher Newport was one armed. And so I'm sure it was a very um, comical scene in some ways in that Christopher Newport actually had to pretty much toss the crown on Powhatan's head because he refused to kneel for it. Um, and you have to ask the question, why would he? Why would he kneel before um, such a man, Christopher Newport? He didn't represent anyone. And at this point, you know, Powhatan had so much power. So what does he give in exchange? Um, he gives Christopher Newport an old, um, it's described as Powhatan's old mantle, um, as well as a pair of old shoes. Um, so the significance here is that this mantle indicates Powhatan's true power. If you look at um, the images here, this represents Powhatan in the center, and uh, you have the deer in, on, on either side, would have, that this um, uh, would have represented the tribute by all of the surrounding villages that he controls. So all the circles would be the tribes that um, owe him tribute and also are a part of, of his network. Um, many uh, American Indian maps, by the way, look like this, um, indicating various circles and the person in charge um, are, is definitely central to these, these mantles. Peace and trade uh, lasted little more than a year. Uh, the English started to assert more control, uh, demanding food. And a lot of this is um, uh, due to the fact that they just lack supplies, um, especially when Christopher Newport was shipwrecked um, in Bermuda, it became very difficult and they were at the brink of starvation. So in uh, 1609, John Smith begins to conduct a lot of raids on the villages uh, taking corn. Uh, he actually at one point captures Powhatan's brother, Upikankanu, and uh, he holds him at gunpoint. 
uh, and demands boatloads of corn for his release, as, as shown in this illustration here. Uh, Powhatan, of course, refused to submit to the English. Um, in 1610, there are indiscriminate attacks against Powhatan subjects. And uh, Smith and others who will follow him, they knew that this was one way to get at Powhatan. So one English expedition, for example, burned the village of Pasipeg and 65 men, women and children were dead. Uh, the chief's family was executed, including his sons. Um, his sons were actually thrown overboard into the water and then shot. So during the war, the English captured Pocahontas in uh, 1613. Uh, she was held prisoner in Jamestown, and as she was kept prisoner, she was um, pretty much locked in one single room, uh, and uh, she was indoctrinated and eventually converted to Christianity and took on the name of Rebecca. Now realize, and this took place almost in, through an entire year, um, Helen Roundtree, historian and anthropologist Helen Roundtree, suggests that she m might have suffered from the Stockholm Syndrome uh, because she was locked up in such a way where she had absolutely no movement. And this is something she would not have been used to uh, because she was allowed to roam free. Um, and as a result, uh, eventually, she, because she agrees to marry John Roth, um, which, you know, again, they're part, the Eng they're part of the English captors, uh, it, it um, ended the war with their marriage and uh, Powhatan uh, finally accepting the fact that, that she was going to marry Roth. Uh, and we all know the story of how they were taken to um, uh, London. Uh, they, the Virginia Company wanted to promote them, uh, wanted to promote the colony of, of Virginia. And of course, while she's walking in the streets of London, uh, she probably picked up some kind of uh, virus uh, and she uh, died of what was referred to as the bloody flux. Um, and she dies in March 1617 at the very young age of 21. Now, shortly after, Powhatan dies as well in 1618. And uh, uh, he hears about her death and it, it really does affect him greatly. So there are a lot of population changes that take place after the death of uh, Pocahontas as well as, as Powhatan. And the population changes are in large part due to these epidemics. The epidemics, waves of pestilence will spread through these communities and it really cuts down their population. Uh, so between 1617 and 1619, you see a lot of these um, uh, uh, tribes, the Virginia tribes, start moving away from the Jamestown itself and the colonists because they see them as um, the reasons for um, their sickness. Okay, Obi Kankanu, let's uh, look at him for just a, a minute in regards to how he's able to consolidate power after um, the death of his brother, uh, Powhatan. And in large part, um, as he's picking up um, the pieces, uh, he is the next in line um, for uh, the, um, the you know, essentially to, to rule the chiefdom. And it takes him a while, but because of all of the atrocities that were committed um, by the English against the, the neighboring tribes, and many of them who were part of the Powhatan's chiefdom, it was no surprise that they actually decided to um, provide their alliance and support of the new paramount chief, uh, Opikankanu. Uh, the English relations had already deteriorated at this point. The immediate causes then of the Second Anglo-Powhatan War was the influx of English immigrants and the encroachment onto tribal lands. They were starting to take the prime lands near the waterway, waterways and so it was starting to cut off their access to it. Um, so on March 22nd, 1622, Upikankanu and his allies staged a surprise attack and killed 347 and uh, uh, just as the English had, it included men, women and children. Uh, one third of the population um, was taken out in this one action. And it is portrayed in this image that you see here. Um, it, it really does, this, this one act forever changes American uh, Indian white relations. Uh, it, depictions like these of American Indians as savage made a very lasting impact on English minds. 
So the new goal of the English was exterminating the tribes. And you see this in various letters and, and uh, transcripts, and they felt justified to do so. This example will be well noted in the future um, with the New England colonies, especially with the massacre of the Pequot tribe by the English Puritans in the 1630s, where they burned alive men, women, and children. Uh, shortly after the uprising, John Smith stated, quote, now we have just cause to destroy them by all means possible. English attacks on tribes were made before harvest and what they didn't take, they burned. Uh, Virginians gained 3,000 acres of quality land in this process. Uh, by 1644, Canoes Confederation ultimately failed and it led to the starvation and disease um, that spread through his, his um, uh, allied tribes. And he was actually captured and killed in 1646. The Powhatan chiefdom died uh, with him. So thereafter, the tribes were forced to pay tribute to the English and essentially they had been replaced. Amid war in 1622, uh, the English yielded over 60,000 pounds of tobacco. Uh, later in the 1620s and the 1630s, it was boom time uh, for tobacco, and they produced tobacco like their lives depended on it, even though they still had food shortages. Uh, the English took over cleared Indian land and spread tobacco cultivation. As the English pushed out Virginia tribes from their homeland, African slavery was fully entrenched in Virginia by 1690 and would forever change the course of American history. So some reflections, uh, indigenous decline, yet persistence and, and survival. Um, what were the ramifications of the English invasion? Uh, the Virginia tribe's population uh, by 1675 was reduced to 3,500 compared to 24,000 in 1607 on the eve of uh, English contact. Europeans, on the other hand, numbered 38,000 and African slaves 2,500 in that same year of 1675. Virginia's tribes suffered tremendous loss uh, in the Anglo-Powhatan Wars. Uh, the English forced survivors onto small reservations and they were forbidden to enter colonial settlements and they were forbidden to have weapons as well. Uh, many fled, uh, they would flee into the Western areas, but then they would potentially approach their enemies. Um, some stayed as tenant farmers. Uh, and over time, they were eclipsed by white settlement. But despite all of these challenges and hardships, uh, Pamunkey and allied tribes remain on their reservations today in Virginia. Uh, though much smaller, it is part of their original homeland. Uh, the Pamunkey tribe won federal recognition in 2015, along with eight, including the Chihuahua, East Chickahominy, Panay, Pahannock, and Nassimon tribes, many of them who were part of Powhatan's original chiefdom. And today they continue to focus on tribal sovereignty, revitalization, and cultural regeneration. Thank you so much. Okay, so thank you for that, Sherry. Um, and thanks more generally to both of you for two papers that very much complemented each other in terms of what's happening, I suppose, in the late 16th and early 17th century in the two areas. Um, questions for, for Hiram or for Sherry? Um, I see Tom Heron and Barry Cogan have their hands up. Um, I'm not sure if, if Thomas is left over from the last last panel, but uh, do either of you have questions or? OK, well, Anthony Harper has just just raised his hand there. So Anthony, if you have a question. Yes, indeed. Um, uh, for Hiram, uh, 
basically, you mentioned the 1641 rebellion. And what I come across is an extraordinary piece of evidence in the 1641 deposition relating to East Cork. Um, this is where a man called Morris Brown asked one of his neighbours in Kai Tool, was he responsible for the murder of an army officer? So, so, sorry, Anthony, could we just, just, just ask you there to, to, to possibly, uh, could you uh, maybe speak a little bit closer to the microphone? I think a few people are having trouble hearing. Sorry. The, the, um, so, Morris Brown asked his neighbour, David Connell of Kai Tool, um, did you murder Ensign Cook outside what is now Middleton? And David Connell said, yes, I'm part of a gang that had been murdering diverse Englishmen on the road between Middleton, as we call it now, and yours. And I'm wondering, is that word Englishman, is that a reference just to Protestants because they murdered the Archdeacon of Cloyne for the fist? to actual English men or English settlers in Ireland? I, I would say it's a reference to Protestants. Uh, as if the Archdeacon of Cloyne at that stage would have been a Church of Ireland Archdeacon, I'm sure. Mm. What do you think yourself, Anthony? Yeah, I, I, I do think it was the Church, well, it was the Church of Ireland Archdeacon. The reason is he was doing um uh, collecting the evidence from people who had been disturbed by rebellious activities in 1641 42 43 mm -hmm. and he was murdered uh just about two miles east of middleton right and so the the evidence from that the, the story is astonishing it comes from mrs elizabeth danvers who gave her evidence to the commission in 1645 and the horror of it was, as she pointed out, they left his body to be exposed to the beast of the of the fields. And uh, basically, you know, obviously left there by the side of the road to be consumed by vermin. So I, I think there must have been a, an element that English and Protestants were seen to be the same thing. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and there's a very good essay on the 1641 depositions by Nicholas Canny, actually, in uh, the uh, Cork History and Society yeah. by uh, Patrick Flanagan and others. Yeah. Uh, and Nicholas uh, uses the uh, 1641 depositions in that case. Uh, it's a very useful essay. Yeah, I, I, I will look that up. Yeah, thank you. Catherine uh, has a question. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Um, well, thank you so much. Um, both of you are really fascinating papers. I really enjoyed them. Um, my questions for Sherry. Um, I really enjoyed uh, all of the information relating to uh, dress and also um, the portrayals of the indigenous populations as well. It was fascinating. Um, my questions about tribute and specifically clothing as tribute. Um, you had the wonderful example of the um, mantle being given there to Newport. I was wondering um, what kind of practice was common at the time for clothing tributes within their own tribes? I think it would, it would have been, uh, it's a great question, and I, I loved your presentation. Uh, I, was, I was noting that you also had some of the same images, so that was really great. Um, uh, but I would say that when uh, Christopher Newport is giving him that, it was described as an old mantle. Um, so, but I think it was also very symbolic. Um, so even even though it may not have been, you know, worth something um, of any significance, I think he was doing it more as, as like a gesture of, you know, I, you know, you are giving me something as tribute, and I'll give you something. Um, 
But uh, in, in many cases, if you were a part of a specific village and you had to uh, bring uh, to the, the whatever wear on say you're, you're working with, it would mainly have been in the form of just skins. Um, I don't have any evidence. I've never seen evidence of um, a lot of specifically, you know, decorated um, just as like Powhatan's mantle. I think that would have been reserved um, perhaps for um, something of a higher tribute, if that makes sense. Um, but I, I think it would have just been in the form of skins. It's usually described as skins. Mm -hmm. um, in the tribe that I specifically study, um, often if you wanted to um, provide a higher tribute to one of the chiefs, um, uh, a lot of the, um, the maps that were drawn um, or at least, de you know, decorated, they were on albino deer skins and those were incredibly rare. Um, so, um, I, the, the only evidence I've seen is, is mainly in the form of skins. Um, yeah. and so that would, that they could process those perhaps at Wero Um, but yeah, it's a great question. I'm, I'm not, you know, really sure how, how much exchange was there. And I, I'm not really sure if they would have a lot of evidence either, um, to find that as, as you know, um, the evidence for American Indians, um, especially in this time period is, uh, there's a lot of bias. I mean, which especially with John Smith's material, because he um, he he has a he's constantly um, deceiving everyone in regards to how he looks and um, how he's portrayed. So <laughs> it's, it's it's very you have to take him with a grain of salt. Um, yeah. Sure. Yes, there's a great question though. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. okay, so just one more question from uh, from Breed, and then we'll we'll break. Yeah, um, thanks. So two great, um, two great papers. I was fascinated by yours, Sherry, but I can't comment on it because I know so little. I have a question for Hiram, which is about Richard Greenville because I've been looking at him. So he comes in and he's almost immediately made sheriff. Uh, this is a problem because to be made sheriff, you need to have a sufficient freehold in the county, and there are other conditions that apply to it. So, how does he operate as a sheriff with no base, with no language? with no knowledge. How, how does he manage? Uh, your mic is up. Yeah, that, uh, that's a very good question indeed. Uh, like the other thing is though, I, I presume that he, he's appointed. He, he Obviously, Sydney must be something to do with his appointment as Sheriff of Cork. Mm -hmm. I presume there's, there's, there's something there. But as you say, he has no base. Uh, he is no, um, he is not a landholder in 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 the uh, in the area. Um, but I, I, I presume he is Sydney's appointment, and he's part of the establishment, the wider establishment of this new regime of a provincial uh, government. Uh, something to do with that. That's all I can assume. Uh, I don't know whether have you any views yourself, uh, Breed. Well, I, I'm assuming he's there to rig the election for the parliament. Right. Interesting. Because he's the, the returning officer. Yes. Well, that's, you know, the whole business of um, uh, of um, of James Fitzmaurice having this alleged parliament, which is really quite a fake thing yeah. entirely. Like he has all these signatures from across the whole of Ireland. And really, he only has, you know, half a dozen people whom he has met around Munster uh, to have this colloquium, uh, which he calls a parliament. Uh, that's an interesting thing in itself, mm -hmm. why this thing is called a parliament and why that is done. Like it, it is interesting in the context of, you know, there was, as you know, uh, an attempt to sort of create a Sydney party with likes of, of Hooker and others yes. in that parliament. Yes. And that's perhaps something Nicholas could comment upon. But yes, I think that's it. Those are very good points in there. Uh, you know, I think there's obviously a lot of things going on where uh, Grenville and Worms and Ledger are generally causing antagonism mm -hmm. in that area. Of yeah. course, uh, Fitzmaurice is quite capable of, of doing things himself. You know, <laughs> there's two sides to the coin. OK, thank, thank you. you. Yes, I agree. I suspect as well that, I mean, in the early years, they might have, you know, people like Grenville in the 1560s and such might have been able to fall back on advice from people like, 
Patrick Sherlock and kind of prominent Munster officials that are operating around Cork and are in Dublin as well quite quite a bit. Well, I assume he would, as as so many of them did, have a sub sheriff who actually did all the legwork. Yeah. Uh, but he's still the man, you know. Yeah. And also, I think that the times aren't really, um, the times are not, not really on the side of the Desmonds at this period, to say the least. Yeah. They're quite in favour of a, of a new provincial uh, dispensation. Mm. That's true. Thank you. OK, um, so look, we might uh, we might break there um, for either lunch or dinner, depending if you're in the old world or the, the new. And uh, we come back at uh, half seven. OK. Thank you, everybody. Cheers.